Well, hello everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Mickey. I'm an analyst and project manager here at Parsons TKO. And for those of you who are just learning about us or joining us for the first time, here at Parsons TKO, we work with nonprofits to improve their marketing tech, business process, and integrated data strategies. So today we'll be talking about social media listening, what it is and the potential applications for the mission-driven sector. So to start, let's start off by defining what social media listening is. So there are two terms that people often get conflated. One is social media listening and the other is social media monitoring. So the easiest way to think about these is that social media monitoring tells you what, while social media listening tells you why. Another way to put this is that social media monitoring is looking at your own organization's social media accounts. And that's tracking things like likes, follows and mentions for your own or your organization's specific account on any social media platform. And then we have social media listening. And this is listening to what a broader audience is saying. And so this is what people can be saying um, about a specific keyword or hashtag. And there's different ways to measure this, whether it's in a geographic location or anything like that. So social media listening can be applied in many different ways. And one is sentiment analysis. And so just to start off with some definitions so we can get all acquainted with what this is, Social media sentiment analysis is a computer algorithm that is used to determine if a writer's attitude towards a specific topic is positive, negative, or neutral. And this kind of thing called sentiment analysis is created using another computer algorithm called natural language processing, which is designed to read and understand human text. And so while these two things can seem very complicated and very computer science-y, these two things play a large role in social media listening and they can be used to enhance the insights that one can glean from social media listening. So on the bottom here, we have a handy little chart. And so you can see that all the elements that we talked about on the previous slide, like emojis, hashtags, and text that are gathered from social media listening all go into this NLP algorithm process um, to give us sentiment analysis results. And the reason that sentiment analysis can be so helpful, especially when used in conjunction with social media listening, is that it can help us to understand the data to create actual action steps for an organization, whether that's improving a marketing or fundraising strategy. So now that we got all the definitions out of the way, um, I'll give a concrete example and I want to show you something that I've worked on personally. Um, and so in addition to my amazing work here at PTKO, I'm also the co-founder of Activism Always, a startup that works to provide social media listening insights to the mission-driven sector. And so I'm going to share with you one of our first projects that we did a little over a year ago um, called Black Lives Matter Always. And with this project, we conducted a sentiment analysis of the Black Lives Matter movement on Twitter immediately following the murder of George, of George Floyd in May of 2020. And so by tracking the usage of specific keywords and hashtags over a period of time, we were able to form a deeper understanding of how the world was reacting to this specific violent event. Okay, so lots of things on this slide, but to start with social media listening, we were able to take this data and create a moving graph that showed the change of BLM always, the movement on Twitter over time. So if you look at this moving chart on the top X axis, you can see the number of times each hashtag was used and how that changed based on how the dates progressed, which is, which is on that bottom X axis. And so by Taking all of this data into account, we were able to distill trends over a period of time by tracking their rise and fall. So what we specifically found was that in the beginning, so right in May of 2020, the most popular hashtags were hashtag George Floyd and hashtag I can't breathe immediately following George Floyd's murder. And then as the movement tended to progress, hashtags like hashtag Juneteenth um, rose in popularity. Um, but they also fell again very quickly since they were more focused around seasonal events. And this, and then lastly, by the end of June, so about a month later after we started this analysis, hashtag George Floyd was no longer trending. Um, so even though in the beginning it was by far the most popular hashtag, within about, about 30 days, it quickly went back to the bottom. And so this is significant because it helps us get a broader view of what's happening on social media. If we had just looked at a trending hashtag for one day, we would have thought that hashtag George Floyd was the most popular hashtag on Twitter representing the Black Lives Matter movement, but that just wasn't true. 
Um, so by kind of just looking at an individual, we wouldn't be able to understand kind of a mass sentiment on social media platforms such as Twitter around a certain topic, which in this case was the Black Lives Matter movement. Another thing to remember is that because social media moves so quickly, it's extremely important to understand not just a moment in time, but the bigger picture of the topic that you're looking at. And of course, social media listening can be really helpful for that um, because it's specifically this holistic view that helps you understand what your audience is interested in and as a result can help you better connect with them on social media. All right, and so this is where the importance particularly about cultural context comes in. So this graph is one from our BLM Always project, and this is a sentiment analysis graph, which we defined briefly earlier on. And so looking at this graph alone, it's very natural to deduce that the majority of the tweets that we saw on Twitter about the Black Lives Matter movement were negative, since we see so many, since a large part of that graph has those black lines. However, what this chart doesn't tell you just looking at it at first glance, is that the sentiments don't actually refer to attitudes towards a specific topic, but actually refers to the language being used. So the majority of Twitter users weren't against BLM or in support of ex-officer Derek Chauvin, um, but they actually were using language that the computer algorithm, the NLP algorithm, marked as negative. So just as we saw with the hashtag bar chart on the previous slide, looking at one specific instant isn't enough when it comes to social media listening. It's far more useful and also, frankly, necessary to look at a bigger picture and look at it holistically to understand it and then utilize it correctly. So we have some example tweets of the types of tweets that we use in this analysis. And so if you look at the details, you can see that it's not necessarily that the majority of the Twitter sphere was anti-BLM. Instead, they were using rhetoric that the computer happened to define as negative. And the kind of things that the computer defined as negative were synonyms of pessimis pessimism, aggressive, hurtful, or crude. And so in this example of a tweet taken act from our actual analysis, um, the negative tweet uses words and phrases such as brazenly and senselessly murdered. And those are the kind of words that the computer algorithm deemed as negative, which is true, they're negative rhetoric. Um, but that does not mean that this Twitter user was against the BLM Always movement. And so just as easy as it was for the algorithm to say that the majority of tweets were negative, and for us to understand that as anti-BLM, it's just as easy for other cultural contexts to get lost in the algorithms, and therefore not necessarily translate to the strategies that we form for our organizations as a result of these insights. Another example is at the top for the positive tweet, you can see that this strategy works that uses words such as um, synonyms of optimism, peaceful and compassionate, um, has words like happy and blessed and love. And in this particular context, this tweeter does seem to be pro BLM. Um, but of course, it's always important to consider the wider context of how these words are being used in this rhetoric and what the larger social media audience thinks about this. So we've talked about what social media listening is, what it can be used for, the pros and cons, but most importantly, it has a lot of room for error, specifically when it comes to sentiment analysis, just like any form of technology does. So to dive in a little bit deeper about how we can overcome these challenges and understand how we can apply social media listing as a tool into the mission-driven sector, we have Chelsea and Zanae here with us today. Hi, Chelsea and Zanae. Hello. I'm so excited to introduce you both. We have Chelsea Louie and Zanae Aquino here with us. And so in addition to her marketing work at PTKO, Chelsea is a communication specialist, and she also is a co-founder and chief communications officer at Activism Always. And we also have Zanae Aquino, who specializes in computer science and is the head of product management at Activism Always, in addition to her work at Salesforce as an architect program specialist. All right, I'm going to pull down my screen share for our conversation. So both of you are here today to help us understand how we can apply something as complex as social media listening to the mission driven sector. So to start, how would you each define social media listening and what's your experience with it? 
Yes, I think social media listening is, again, a complex idea. It's, again, the observation and collection of what's being said on social media. And again, what you mentioned before, and the most important part about it is how you're listening, actively listening and applying it to your own case. Um, my experience with social media listening is seeing what trends are, seeing what's being said and trying to cater my content to um, increase engagement. And I've been able to do it in a variety of contexts, whether it be my own personal brand um, here at over at Activism Always, with um, the context of being able to be inclusive to different audiences and additionally um, in the corporate sector uh, to appeal to different architects in the software industry. Yeah. Great, thank you. What about you, Chelsea? Yeah, following up on that, I think my experience with social media listening is a little interesting. So I was originally on that uh, BLM Always project with Mickey uh, way back. Um, and that was actually sort of my first sort of technical project with sentiment analysis and like working with NLP analysis and actually learning all that terminology. Um, I think my background is definitely more in sort of the analysis of that work. So I'd never worked with the actual like algorithms to develop the like social media listening. Um, but my background is in sort of analyzing social media from sort of traditional more like communications practices. Um, and I think in that project, I was able to see like all these like sort of traditional methods of going on social media and just seeing what people are listening to, collecting interesting posts um, that was made so much easier using these technologies. Um, so I'm coming in with a bit of a non-technical background, um, but very happy to be here as well um, with my experience with uh, BLM Always. Thanks so much, Chelsea. And Zanae, so since you work in computer science and have a very strong technical background, I know that we already kind of went over this, but how would you personally define social media listening? Yeah, personally defining social media listening, it's, I guess, in the most, um, what is it? contextually appropriate definition. I think the difference between social media listening and monitoring is that when you're listening, you're applying. When you're listening, you're actively taking the insights and um, curating your content um, in order to adapt to that. Um, and social media listening is just being able to take the raw data. So taking your likes, engagements, being able to track that and see what works and what doesn't work um, and, or in terms of curating your presence because we don't want to overload our audiences with things that aren't necessary and things that don't work. So by curating and making that happen, um, that's, I think, the most important part of it. I really love that piece that you said about social media listening is applying. I think that's so important, especially when we're talking about appealing to our audiences. And so why is it important to be talking about social media listening in context to specific audiences? Yeah, so social media, one thing to note about it is that it's not a single demographic. There are all different types of people who are using the internet. We have people from Gen Z ranging to people in like Gen X. So people are being, um, people find different things to be attractive to them, to be appealing to them. So there are different interpretations, different backgrounds and experiences. And you need to be able to make sure that your target demographic is being appealed to. You can't be having your target graphic be um, for example, like nonprofit organizations and only be taking up a tone that's only appealing to profit organizations. That's an important thing to notice. It's important to cater your information that you're presenting in a way that the target audience can understand by either simplifying it, by going into detail about a specific topic, um, all those different kinds of curations and customizations to make sure that you're doing the right thing with your presence. Yeah, I think Zane said it super well already. Um, I think really the point of how social media listening affects audiences is that those audiences already exist out there. Like people are already using social media, people are existing in these sort of bubbles of, of different audience types. Um, and most people exist within many different bubbles. So I think Zane mentioned like generational gaps, like young people are probably going to hang out with other young people. Maybe you're interested in one topic like environmental justice, for example, you might be interacting in a bubble of people who are interested in that topic. And these bubbles exist with their own norms, with their own cultures. Um, so trying to like create a, a sort of communications message, trying to do something with social media, it doesn't make sense to just sort of like put out a message that's for a general audiences. Um, because most people aren't a general audience. People have their communities, they have their sort of specifics. So crafting that message 
involves a little bit more thinking and that starts with I think the listening aspect of it. Amazing points, thank you. And so you already touched on this a little bit, but if you could just go into some more detail about why the concept of social media listening is so important specifically to the mission-driven sector. Like you mentioned, Zanae, we know that a lot of more like for-profit companies and corporations have used social media listening for a long time, but why is it so important to incorporate that into the mission-driven sector? Yeah, um, I think it's important that the concept of virality in terms of uh, defining that as just high traffic, high engagement, and the spread of ideas is not limited to just the commercial side of a lot of the world. People aren't just appealed to like how much money is being made or what's super cool and everything. With the mission-driven sector, what I think is really important about that group is that um, a lot of the times the narrative that's adapted to that is a more empathetic kind of view. And especially as we can see after the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement took up and uh, momentum and everything that a lot of people are appealing to the human side of the stories being shared. Like social media isn't all about just irony and humor anymore. It's about building connections, understanding different types of perspectives. And um, in order to understand why it's important, specifically the mission driven sector, um, you could just see how social media has impacted everybody outside of it. Think about GoFundMe, think about um, like different sorts of, like the fact that we're having this conversation as a result of the kind of momentum that social media has been able to garner. And if you're able to spread the word out, you're, um, and if you're able to increase the engagement for it, you can uh, spread so many different types of messages, so many different types of missions. And it's important to see like the concept of getting popular on social media as more of like more people are willing to hear what you have to say. And I think the goal of building momentum for a lot of mission driven sectors is just getting your word out, getting um, your cause to have importance in the eyes of others. Yeah, I, I definitely want to add on to sort of like the popularity um, sort of aspect or even just thinking about in terms of like reach like social media is fantastic for finding those very specific audiences and trying to spread the message and target that sort of word um, in, in these much more targeted ways so many people use social media and they use it for so many different reasons um, I think going back to I think the original question you had Mickey um, was sort of about um, the concept of social media listening and how it's applicable to mission driven organizations. I think it's incredibly applicable and I think while we're talking about it in like a semi technical way right now calling like social media listening and maybe discussing some of the algorithms, I think it's definitely like tried and true like procedures for most people who use, who use social media most of the time you're trying to use social media to listen to what other people are listening to or like talking about um so the idea of using it for your organization is taking those sort of practices that we may have in our sort of individual lives our personal lives being able to listen to people in social media and sort of amplifying it targeting it um, expanding the reach of like what we're listening to and also listening to things much more specifically. Um, I think this is definitely like procedures that are more common in commercial industries. Like Zane mentioned, like organizations who are trying to sell things, they're definitely like using social listening technologies or having like staff members like be involved in social media and listening to what people are talking to about their brand. Um, so I think there's definitely room for mission driven organizations to capture these processes um, to, to maybe do something other than maybe like sell a product, but maybe to spread a message about their cause um, or the organization, their services. I really love that connection between listening, just how we do in everyday life and social media listening. I think it's really helpful to see something as complex and technical as social media listening is just another way of what we do in everyday life, specifically in the mission driven sector, being empathetic, listening, being receptive to other voices. I think that's a fantastic point. So we have a audience question from Mary Price. Thanks so much for your question, Mary. Um, and so Mary's question is, are there social listening tools that are better for assessing other languages on social? 
Yeah, to get into this question a little bit, I think it's under, like it's important to understand how the listening happens. Um, in terms of social media listening, it's all data driven. So what it's doing is that it's taking what's currently happening, pulling that information. So what I mean by that is that the current feed of tweets, that sort of thing. And you could specify, and then actually, sorry. Um, and then what you do from that is that you're drawing insights from the words that are being used. Like if you remember what Mickey was showing earlier in terms of positive, negative, neutral analysis, what that is, is that there's a trained model that's able to determine like what's positive and what's negative. And so um, in terms of actual things in the market that are adapting to different languages, those models need to be listening to those specific languages. And off the top of my head, I'm not completely sure of what in the market is currently appealing to different sorts of languages, but that in general structure is kind of what's um, happening. So looking for social media tools that are multilingual in terms of pulling different data from different um, uh, different like regions, different like language uh, specific regions um, is just an important thing to look out for when you're looking for those tools. That's such a great point. That reminds me of one of my projects here at Parsons TKO where a client was looking at a specific keyword on social media uh, that was Spanish and there are so many different variations with accents and different spellings and abbreviations that weren't originally accounted for that they would have missed out on all of this insight. So thank you for that point. And we have one more question um, from Mari, which is, do you find that some social platforms are easier to listen to than others simply based on the structure of the platform? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one thing that I think it's important to note is that, once again, going back to the, um, the sentiment analysis that works the best on um, and the easiest, I think, on text-based platforms. So think about like general Facebook posts and tweets. Um, that's like the easiest to run a sentiment analysis on compared to like, for example, Instagram or TikTok, where you have moving images and like the analysis and the models that have to go into that have to be much more complex. I think just as a quick add on to that, I think in addition to the tool or the technology or the platform you choose to listen to, it also depends on your organization itself and sort of like where have where do you know that you have communities and where do you want to learn from. Like if you're picking Twitter because it's easy or because there's text there, but you have no community there at all, or you're not sure even where to start, it might actually be a bit more difficult to find sort of relevant insights. Um, and I think similarly, like people on staff, if people on staff are really familiar with like looking at Facebook posts, um, you guys have been posting on Facebook forever, you know sort of what's the cadence of how people post on Facebook, it'll be much easier to analyze at the end of it all um, than if you're picking something like TikTok that maybe no one on your staff uses. So that's also a little human aspect to, to keep in mind. Definitely love that tangible action step. And speaking of that, do you have any tips or recommendations for how social media listening can be adapted to the mission driven sector? I think for tips for adaption, so like adopting the technology, mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest thing when adopting any new technology in addition to like social media listening is to remember it's it's never like a one-to-one -one adoption. I think I just mentioned that like, just because this tool might be really good and a lot of people use it, um, it doesn't mean it might be the right one for your organization. You might need to tailor it a bit. Um, so for this, the same example, like if your organization's really familiar with Facebook, you know a lot of people on Facebook talk, talk about the topic that you're interested in, maybe like the geographic location you're in, people use Facebook for like finding things around the services you offer. Um, it makes sense to find a tool that might be more suited for that rather than maybe get use like a big Twitter tool or a Twitter sort of like algorithm that everyone else uses. Um, so I think that's just something to remember. Um, yeah, the value of the, of, the, of the technology only matters as much as it's fit to your organization. Um, so yeah, I think that also goes back to, I think Mary's question earlier about like languages. So maybe like the English models are like the really popular one, but if you're like doing work that maybe is majority in Spanish, you might need to look for a more specific model, maybe more specific um, analysts to understand that technology. 
Fantastic. And keeping that momentum of shifting a little bit from the conceptual theories of social media listening to how everyone here can actually apply it to their organization. Um, what tools have you used for kind of introductory social media listening um, or alternate ways of listening or hearing from your audience, even if you're not using these tools? Yeah. Zanae, do you have any, any tools in mind? Yeah, so currently the product that we're working on at Activism Always is this product called Mary Alice. And what the thing that I think is the most important about it is that it provides concise feedback in terms of what sort of what kind of data is being pulled. So for example, the best ways to have an increased presence is um, like knowing the timing of your post, knowing like when is your audience the most active, being able to draw insight for that and timing your posts around that time using keywords and hashtags. Like if people are tracking specific trends or um, the algorithm itself is grouping specific things, how can you make sure that your information is being captured into it um, as well? Um, yeah, with Mary Alice, it's not able to track just your own personal trends, but trends throughout the entire Twitter sphere and um, dictate how you can advance your engagements with those in mind. Um, I've also seen one of the most important, I think, what's it called? One of the most important um, things to keep in mind with social media engagement. One of the biggest trends I've been able to see right now is that personal engagement in terms of like, how can they interact with this post? That's something that has garnered popularity. So whether it be polls, whether it be like retweets and like quote tweets or just answering questions that you kind of have there, those are what I've been seeing as the major trends through um, the analysts, the, sorry, the analytics that we've been able to provide as well as um, different, yeah, different just sort of insights in that context. Yeah, Neuralis is cool, cool tool, tool that we're working on. And I think um, as we develop that, I think a much more lo-fi method um, that you can also use is really just sort of like the manual staff member checking back on your posts. Uh, if we're going back to like social media listening as a name, it's, it's listening to your social media. Um, so really thinking about sort of your day-to-day -day sort of interactions with social media, if you're putting out a post, on LinkedIn um, and you see maybe in the notification that you're getting five, 10, 15, 20 sort of like likes or comments. Um, are you actually going back and, and seeing who's messaging you, um, seeing who's liking those posts and are you actually re-interacting and re-engaging with them? I think that's a very basic way to be like listening to your social media and actually just like taking the step and taking action with your social media engagement. Um, that's something that I feel like most times we think of and we're like, that makes sense, you should do that, um, and may fall to the wayside um, because there's so many other things going on. But really, sort of the manual labor of going in and engaging your social media audience and listening to them is, is a very lo-fi way to, to get involved with at least these procedures. Because um, I'm sure not everyone has a huge budget to be like, getting an, an analyst that can do sentiment analysis and NLP like at the moment um, or even like adopting a new tool. So those type of procedures to go back and listen can be really useful. Thank you for highlighting that difference, Chelsea. For example, with the BLM Always project, we were analyzing 10K tweets a day over the course of about three months. So with that volume, of course, the help of NLP and AI algorithms is very helpful. But if you're just doing your organization's tweets or just from one day, or even just a smaller part of the sector, it definitely is super accessible just to use those in-house Facebook analytics or Twitter analytics and things like that. Yeah, and I guess, oh, and last thing to sort of highlight that difference again, right, like the social media monitoring might be only looking at the, the tweets or the posts that you put out. Um, and that can be really interesting in lots of ways. You can track sort of like your growth over time. Um, but then if we want to do listening, it's as Mickey mentions, maybe carving out a small community within sort of the, the sector that you occupy or the industry that you occupy and listening to not only like what other people, what's happening around your post, but might be happening around sort of like uh, peers, uh, happening around like activists in your organization, advocates for your causes, um, and trying to like patch um, those conversations together. See, like, is everyone talking about this one topic this week? Why are they talking about it and doing that little deeper research? We have another audience question from Lisa. 
uh, which is how can you use social listening to identify a target audience or how a brand is perceived by different segments? I feel like that's such a good question and so many people have um, this question. So I would love to hear both of your takes on this. Yeah, so one thing to note about when you're collecting information and data is that in order to find out if something is good or um, viral or popular, you're grouping things together. So what that means is that in terms of determining different demographics, you're not necessarily assigning an identity to each individual user. You're more so tracking like, okay, what's being used popularly? What is a common trend that you're able to garner from that? Um, as Mickey mentioned earlier, like with the senselessly murder, that's high um, high volumes of people, typically, um, not to generalize, the so people who are having like a higher lexicon with those sorts of um, terminology is part of a specific demographic compared to um, Gen Z, for example, that happen to ironically use like the skull emoji. Um, so like, again, different contexts um, kind of are important in order to determine that. And from like the data analytics side, we'll get into this later, um, it's important to have different demographics or different trends um, catered to by, by having a diverse background of like data that you're kind of filling in. Anything to add to that, Chelsea? Um, I don't think I have anything to add to that specifically. Um, I think identifying target audience, I think as Zanae mentioned, you're, you're going to get a lot of data and it's going to be a lot of sorting through. Um, but I think it's part of that sort of like procedural practice um, that you you hone in on that target audience. And it might take, like like Mickey mentioned, we collected a lot, a lot of tweets over a span of many months. Um, it, it also requires you building up sort of, that's like building up the amount of data um, to actually be able to sort of like parse out those trends. And if you're doing a more lo-fi method, um, it can be more difficult. It means more, tr more tweets that you have to like look at manually um, but I think it's part of like, are you documenting it? Um, are you keeping track of like the tone of the posts that you're getting? Um, sort of like the sort of sentiment analyses you're getting. Are you getting overwhelmingly positive? Why so? And like following those leads in order to create that sort of target audience um, or seeing at least what audience you're, you're filtering out the most. For sure. That ties into a question that Jamie asked about our BLM Always project. And so Jamie asked, how are we identifying the hashtags overall? And was that ongoing or all after the fact? Um, and so Chelsea and Zanae, I'll let you both add on to this since you worked on the project as well. Um, but the first thought that comes to mind is that we mostly did a lot of word association. Um, so hashtags that were used also with BLM, such as Black Lives Matter or Stop the Hate or anything like that. Um, that were associated or used in conjunction with that BLM always, it was a lot easier to identify them that way. Um, and then in terms of like the flow, it was all mostly after the fact. Chelsea's a name, was that about right? Yeah, I think it's about right, yeah. And we sorted both on sort of like major keywords that were used um, yes. in like different tweets. And we also looked at trending hashtags. Um, so those were sort of ways that we were able to to, to do our analysis. I think you mentioned directly sort of the hashtag uh, visualization, um, but it was really just like from all the posts we were getting and then sifting them out in relation to sort of like the BLM always or the BLM um, like keyword. And that was sifted out mainly using NLP. And then Chelsea, I have a follow-up question for you from Andrew Courtney um, and the observation about manual and hands-on when would you suggest that someone or an organization invests in tools versus conducting it manually? Is it purely based off of volume or some other factor? Yeah, I think similarly to my answer earlier, it really depends on where you're at with your organization, right? Um, so if it's sort of the first time you've ever heard of like social media listening at all, I'd recommend maybe doing a little more research, maybe trying to do it manually and seeing how it feels to actually engage with that practice. Um, but I'd say to not shy away from like uh, contacting sort of like PTKO, we do a lot of work um, around this type of these type of conversations, right? So contacting someone who maybe have a bit more practice, like presenting consulting, presenting sort of like um, sort of like strategies for using social media listening. That's like one method. Um, I think when you're investing on tools themselves, 
that really, really depends on your organization. Like, do you have the budget for it? Do you have someone that can actually like um, take that data and analyze it? I think if there's someone on your team that's already like, I know what social media listening is, um, we definitely have the budget. We, we definitely know what to do with it. We have like a goal than to like go ahead and invest in those tools, um, invest in sort of like higher end consulting, whatever you need. Um, but until then, I'd recommend sort of thinking about doing it manually and then maybe contacting someone, calling someone that can discuss strategies to move forward. Yeah, it really depends. Just to add on to that, I think probably the best application of using tools is in conjunction with that strategic part. Like you mentioned that we do at Parsons TKO Chelsea, um, but a lot of time the data is the, just gathering the data is half of the battle. The other half is actually applying it to strategic insights. And Joel has a similar question about that. Um, could either Zanae or Chelsea, could you provide an example of how the insights that have been gathered from social media listening led to a newly informed strategic or tactical action for an organization? Oh. I mean, I can talk a little bit in terms of um, the BLM Always project that we worked on. Um, so yeah, I think this project was a bit of a passion project for our team. Um, it wasn't for any specific client. It was something that we were just, it was, it was a situation in which we were very passionate about what was going on. Um, we saw sort of the context of it. A lot of what was happening was on social media. It was right at the start of the pandemic. People were at, at home and social media was such a sort of like potent communications um, sort of channel, I guess. Um, so I think for us using NLP and using sentiment analysis helped us understand what was going on as individuals, as sort of a team of like analysts and researchers to understand what was going on in sort of like the, the wild, wild west of, of Twitter. Um, talking about uh, these massive protests and being able to take insights that where we can sort of talk to our friends about it. We can talk to other teams about it. Um, when we were developing it, we were part of, everyone in our team was part of a mentorship program. So we could share that information um, and really make sense of sort of like the big conversations out there. Um, while this is maybe not particularly strategic or tactical for, for an organization because the project was rooted in sort of like personal interests. Um, we were able to sort of take that information, get that those like big ideas, those big conversations and sort of create it into a visual like the one you saw with the, the hashtag graph that was moving. Uh, we can take those big conversations and make it something a little bit more palatable, a little bit more targeted. So when we do lead those conversations, um, we have something to show and something to share. I think in terms of your organization, if you did something similar, you can use it to discuss things like, these are the major topics in our industry that we need to focus on more. Um, it can be used to help support budgets. It can be helped to use sort of like support where your team wants to target your social media messaging in the future. Um, and can be some type of tool that you can use to sort of understand where the trends are going potentially. Um, so little all over place wasn't a specific example, but I think really the power of social media listening is being able to listen and take all that information and create something a bit more targeted. Yeah, I'm interested to hear your perspective on this, Chelsea, specifically as a communications expert. Um, how can social media be applied to like marketing or branding strategies? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is you're able to um, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about audience already. So able to like see the type of language that your audience is using, see sort of like the trends and topics your audience might skew towards. Um, like the basic examples, like, are they talking about this really positively? Like, is everyone talking about it filled with um, like at least generic examples of like love and positivity and happiness around the topic? Or are people very angry um, for valid reasons? Or is this anger in part because that is the language being chosen by your audience members. Um, when you're creating a message, you can take sort of those um, inspirations from your audience and how they're talking and being able to create a message that's a bit more appropriate. I think it's so easy to have like really good intentions and being like, this is a great post. This is a great message that I think my audience will love. And then you put it out and it's completely tone deaf. Even if you have the best intentions, it's being able to like kind of check your work. Um, make your work more targeted. 
so happy you said that piece about tone deaf. And I know, Zanae, that's something that you mentioned earlier about understanding different generational differences. So how could NLP and sentiment analysis and other algorithms like that that are part of social media listening become more culturally inclusive? Yeah, um, in this case, I think it's important to note, like as you mentioned before with the BLM Always Project, you're pulling like 10,000 tweets, I believe, over the course of like months. Um, when you're pulling all of that data and pulling all of the information from the Twitter sphere, that allows you to draw insights of all different kinds of people. If you were searching for like just using a specific keyword and not necessarily considering what other people are saying, um, that means that the model that you're building, the insights that you're creating are going to be curated um, to a specific audience when you need to be able to be look at it um, as a whole. Um, so yes, again, that's why it's important to see what kinds of words are being used by a lot of people, like be able to be conscious of spelling, miscommunication, and also different like contextual differences and different cadences and different kinds of terminology. And that comes again at the uh, diversity of data analytics, whether it be the team that's listening to it, whether it be the types of information that you're um, considering is correct. Because one thing you have to do when you're looking at data is clean it as in like determine what isn't contextually correct and what is is and that grouping once again um, comes when you're um, able to keep in mind the different kinds of context so in terms um yeah so in terms of being inclusive in our data collection making you have to make sure that every person all the people that sometimes fall into the cracks are being listened to and that you're turning those trends as a priority when you're being inclusive like in the case of um, sometimes in NLP jokes or references that only apply to a certain community are misconstrued pretty often or like terminology is being used to intensify a term but it isn't necessarily like captured. So um, I think it's important that the algorithms are just conscious of that kind of data. Um, so yeah, computers struggle sometimes with understanding context, because it's again, you're, it's being trained solely by what you tell it. Um, and again, it's kind of hard to teach a computer a joke. <laughs> but um, overall, I think algorithms are working towards building more inclusive models, because people are being conscientious of that, especially with a new generation coming into the workforce. Or anything to add to that, Chelsea, before we move on? Um, I don't have anything to add on to that specific. I think Zanae said perfectly, like, it's it's hard to teach a computer a joke. I think when it comes down to it, your computer yeah. can get a lot of information. And then from there, you actually have to make make the decision of, like, do you believe what the computer is saying? Um, how are you going to edit the computer to make it make more sense? And also think about sort of the staff members on staff, the analysts you have that are actually working on it. Um, there's so much around like we have inclusive technologies or we have like inclusive algorithms um, or more powerful algorithms. But when it comes down to it, it really is sort of like the person making that strategic decision. Um, we're getting all this information. Do we actually like set out a campaign with this language um, because the computer told us to or because like the people of color that are on our staff um let's give us like a go or does our staff is our staff actually representative um of sort of the messages that we're putting out or are we putting out for like to like put out a face um yeah i think it, when we're talking about like diversity and like messaging um or to be culturally inclusive in messaging it goes way beyond the technology for sure. And following on that similar vein, I know that the industry standard for sentiment analysis is positive, neutral, and negative. Um, but our audience is wondering if algorithms can recognize things like sarcasm, nuance, justifiable anger, sadness, etc. Um, to answer that, I think we need to go back to remembering that a computer only knows as much as you tell it. Um, so in terms of senselessly murdered that negative kind of context sometimes when you're doing that cleaning itself you have to be able to catch those things in the track or in like the cracks um, and that once again comes from like a more manual sort of thing so in terms of capturing sarcasm like in order to do that you need to be giving the computer different kinds of context telling it what's right and what's wrong training the model and being like okay 
this specific wording of this is right, this specific one is wrong. And that sometimes comes at like the cost of more time and um, processing that needs to happen. But otherwise it is possible, but in the industry right now, it's a challenge. Yeah, I love that piece about AI that you touched on. We didn't really cover that in the presentation, but all the things that we're talking about are artificial intelligence. And so just as Anae said, you have to train the models. Um, so they have to be given that information in order to understand those different things. And so if these models are trained explicitly on Gen Z humor, which can be a mess, and we can say that because we're all Gen Z, um, then they may understand those types of things more easily. All right, and jumping to our next question. So part of the purpose of social media listening is to expand your reach um, because there can be such a wide range of users and audiences, but because it's not very common for the mission driven sector to have diversified internally, it could be hard to gauge for what that cultural context is, like you were saying for on staff members, Chelsea. So how can social media listening help mission driven organizations better understand their audience, but also vice versa? So I'm taking this question is to see like, how can social media listening not only help like the organization craft the message for the audience, but maybe how it can get the audience to like interact more with the organization itself. Um, and I think it, it goes, awesome. Uh, I think it goes back to what I was saying about like the tone deafness um, of, of a lot of social media messaging, especially if you're an organization that doesn't have a lot of experience like crafting social media messages um, or, or crafting sort of like uh, very targeted communication messages. Um, being able to create a message that resonates with your audience, that uses language that actually um, catches their attention or uh, keeps their attention or actually feels comfortable for them to engage with is, is huge. Um, I think it's easier to be like, here's my standard sort of press release type language that I will, I will put out into the world. Um, and to expect people, regular everyday people, like most of us out here, um, to, to feel like compelled to actually reply to that post or feel compelled to like do something with that post other than seeing it as like, oh, they posted a new blog. I guess I'll click the blog um, is, is really, really powerful. I think it's, it's sort of like the organization taking a step out to understand the audience for the audience to take a step back um, or take a step forward and to understand the organization more. Um, and when we're talking about sort of like uh, inclusive messaging or culturally sensitive messaging, it's thinking of like, when we're crafting these messages, we have so many different people out there. Um, it's really, really rare that you have a, a audience that's totally like, that's totally like, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word, but the word to say like everyone in the audience is exactly the same, right? Um, so creating a message in which like everyone's getting a little closer together. The audience is taking a step forward. The organization's putting their foot out um, to, to really try to like be closer and actually like have a better, more valuable conversation that goes beyond the sort of like, I'm an organization that does cool stuff, but I will share it in like a bland general audience kind of way um, and expect audiences to to take like five steps forward to engage with that. Um, yeah, not sure if I answered that, Mickey. So tell me if there's anything you want me to add. Well, I think that was fantastic. Thank you. All right. So our last question I have for both of you is how can we imagine the future of social media listening? What do you wish could be done differently? And also, how could it be improved? Did you want to go? Question. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a heavy question um, in terms of like, how are we going to advance this as a whole? I think in the market right now, most social media listening tools are looking at your own personal kind of engagements as in like, 
you're only finding out what a post of your own are working. But as you mentioned before, I think it's important, or I think the industry needs to move in a direction where you're listening to all of the trends as a whole. Like you're listening to all the different kinds of things that exist in the spaces so that you're catering your content, not just to like what you find individually works, but rather what works in the context of like the social media space as a whole. So like, again, like listening, going back to what listening is in general, when you're a good listener, you're taking the information that you're learning from another person and applying it to your response. So if you're not, if you're just building off of what you said previously, you're not going to be seen as like, you know, um, an engaging kind of speaker or, or that sort of deal. So by just applying that knowledge um, from seeing what other people are saying, seeing what works, I think that's going to really shift the way that organizations and also people are um, dealing with their social media. Yeah, and I guess to to just add on to that, I think the one thing that could be improved, I think, is that a lot of this technology and a lot of this work is um, is described as highly technical because you are using those algorithms. You do have to like run those tools, um, and that typically requires someone that has a bit of a technical background to be able to do that. Uh, but when it comes down to it, it's it's sort of like as Zanae Ray said, like it's it's listening, it's good listening. Um, and these are tools that like make that good listening easier and faster, and you can get a much higher volume um, of information, but it's good listening. Um, and it really starts with like social media literacy within your organization. Like, does your organization care about it? Um, and does your organization sort of care about like being better listeners and having better literacy about your industry, about uh, your peers, about your audiences. Um, so yeah, I think that's something that comes to mind of what can be sort of done differently is like shifting how we view it as something like, it doesn't have to be an expensive tool or a very technical like, like thing that you have a, to adopt on the go. Um, as like the world is shifting, it feels like everything's moving so quickly, but it, it just requires like, do you care about social media as a communication channel? And if so, are you listening to your audiences to make good social media like communication practices in your organization? And then the tools come with, with that developing um, sort of procedure, those developing practices. Amazing. Thank you so much to both of you for all of your amazing insights, Chelsea and Zanae, I really appreciate it. And also thank you so much to all of our attendees for joining us today. We're so happy that you're able to come. And we also would love to stay in touch. We have our LinkedIn page and group links up here for you to join. And would also love to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about how social media can help your organization and how to adapt it and adopt all of those complex technologies that Chelsea and Zanae were talking about.